Welcome to all to this uh, event. My name is Maria Gavrilidou. I am from Athens, Greece, and I am the chair of the User Involvement Committee, which together with the Clarin Office organizes this event. Uh, it is a special kind of a Clarin Café. You can have information of uh, previous Clarin Cafés on the uh, site that we have. This one, focuses on exploring the potential of digital tools for learning. And it is going to be a practical workshop, hands-on. And uh, it is a crash course that targets academics and researchers uh, who are interested, or anybody else uh, for that, who are interested in learning how to uh, attract their audience's uh, attention how to be more interactive, how to produce online training material to keep the audience interested. This topic uh, was, uh, is a topic that interests many of us who teach or who were uh, lecture at some time, as we are forced all by the pandemic to transform our courses to online material. And then we found out that simply producing PowerPoints or any other such type of uh, material does not seem very fascinating to our students. So this is how we thought about this topic. And this is how we invited our speaker, Isabel Gonchober, to uh, give this seminar. And uh, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Isabel who is the deputy head of the Center of, for Applied Research and Innovation in Lifelong Learning. And she also is a researcher at the University for Continuing Education in Krems, all this in Austria. Her research focuses on learning outcome and competence-based learning. That means centering on the uh, learner for that of continuing education and vocational education and training, critical analysis and evaluation of e-learning environments, how to implement digital tools and platforms and functions to support learning, and how to validate non-formal and informal learning. Besides all that, she's an advisor for industry and business projects on work-based learning. And with that, I welcome Isabel and give the floor to her for a very interesting seminar that we all look forward to. Isabel, the floor Thank is Thank you for yours. the introduction and um, for having me today. And I'm really looking forward to um, working with all of you and, and also getting to know you a bit. So today, by the way, just to see, you know, behind the scenes kind of, um, I'm working with Canva. We, um, where I created the slides. And um, today I will switch between Canva, where I share my slides directly from this program, and um, Google Jamboard, where we will um, discuss and brainstorm. So just for you to know, and now I start to share my slides. <clears throat> and well, we want to explore today the potential of digital tools for learning. Um, so we all have experienced a lot of online learning in the last three years, I believe. And I think it's time to have a recap. And this is what we're going to do today. And um, I just show you the today's program. Um, we will answer the for following questions. I hope we can answer them answer them, answer them all today. Um, what is e-learning and what are the different phases of e-learning? We'll also have an activity here. Um, what are the top e-learning tools at the moment? Plus activity again. Um, what is influencing the success of online learning? How to plan online learning? And what are the challenges of learning, um, of online learning and how to uh, overcome them? Yeah. Um, and in the end, we'll also have, uh, I'll share with you some um, good practice examples or just practice ex examples. We can evaluate how well they work. And um, as you see, um, it won't be just a lot of lecture and afterwards we'll have discussion or activity, but I will, um, you know, <clears throat> have activities always, you know, in between a bit. Um, so 
um, we are active and you can be active and we can really get into talking and thinking. Um, you heard a few things already about me. Um, by the way, I'm also on all social networks that there are. <laughs> so meanwhile, I actually have to add here, of course, I'm also on LinkedIn, but I'm also on TikTok. Uh, I'm not yet, um, you know, actively um, um, putting online so many videos on TikTok, but I'm there <laughs> to see what is going on there. Um, um, I am a researcher, as you already heard, um, at the University for Continuing Education. So mainly I'm working with adult learners and in, um, I'm working with adult learners on a high education level, um, but not necessarily in high education. Yeah? And um, I'm really passionate about learning. And, um, and as a first task, um, I ask myself, what I actually, what do I think of when I hear the term e-learning and usually it's like social learning i think of social learning about um of flexibility of freedom and that it's my job and the job that i love um, but actually i'm also thinking about a few dark sides and um and i'm also i, I would really love to hear what you are also thinking of when you hear the term e-learning and we will have a task soon um, thank you for all of your um, postings on Padlet by the way um, for everyone who or for, for all the people who, who missed it I just share the link I think I have it here yeah I just share it in the chat again so you can access the Padlet and I would love if you could just add a few words about yourself um, in this Padlet and there is like a little plus symbol um, down here and um, so you can just add it if you have time in between you know wh wh while I'm talking yeah <laughs> and I um, I read through um, the the inputs that you have shared in this Padlet. And what I found interesting is that, um, um, that it can be a topic, how to share your passion about your um, research field, um, about the topics of interest um, online and how to do that in a, in, a, in a good way. So it's really, you know, um, so the learners really understand it. You know? um, a lot of um, many of you are in course design, so they want to learn something about how to include digital tools in um, course design. And if somebody also said um, she wants to have more time for really working with students through the use of e-learning. And we will also have a look at that. <clears throat> and um, thank you for again for your um, um, inputs. And um, I really want to know now what you associate with e-learning. So what are the things that come to your mind? You could also add already tools, but also maybe how do you feel about e-learning? Um, and what kind of basic experiences that come to your mind when you hear e-learning? And for that, we will use the following tool. It is called Google Jamboard. And it's a very good, digital board for everybody who is a starter. Um, so in case you have a workshop with people that you don't know, so you don't know, like in my case, um, the, about the digital competences of the, um, the participants, it makes sense to use a tool which has not so much functionalities, so people are not overwhelmed with using it. So he, you, he's, you see here that we have 10 slides. We have 10 different slides that we are using for work today and for brainstorming. Yeah? And um, in each slide, I have like a, a question and, um, and this is like um, one topic per slide that we're having, one discussion topic. And um, you can add here um, in the menu on the left, um, a note. Yeah? And then it's opening here and then you can add a note like, um, I'm adding here fun because e-learning is fun for me. Okay, I save and then I have the, 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 the um, post it here and I can, you know, move it around. 
Um, you could actually also add John, also text field. You could add, you know, any kind of shapes. You could also um, write something on this Padlet like that, yeah, on this kind of Jamboard. So now it's time to do some experimentation. Um, just pick a, um, a post-it here, a virtual post-it here, and add what you associate with e-learning. Um, thank you for all your inputs. Um, and as you saw that I already tried to uh, cluster it a bit. Um, so what I will do is I always try to immediately cluster it somehow if I see um, some categories are emerging. <clears throat> and um, what I will do after this workshop is I will have a look at all of your inputs again, finishing the clustering and share with you, you know, the outcome of the clustering. So you have something, you know, also after this workshop to keep in, you know, to remember it and um, to think about what we did. Um, so let's have a quick look at it. Um, many of you um, um, said that the inclusiveness is a very positive aspect um, and that the easy access. So I think especially for also for people who are um, adults and have full time jobs, e-learning and online learning gives a lot of opportunities to um, for continuing education, for example. Um, or, the, or also, you know, starting a whole new thing online, um, <clears throat> learning a new kind of skill online. Um, but there are also some, and of course, there is this flexibility. Um, we have the chance of ah, of um, um, interactive features and um, of nonlinear course courses and. Um, um, and we all also have the chance through all this media that we're using that it's just fun, you know, it can be also edutainment is a big thing in e learning that is motivative. And there is this potential of having highly experimental and innov innovative kind of settings there. But there is also a dark side. Um, for example, it is difficult to keep um, video content up to date. So you have to actually, you know, share all this new video content and especially video content can be cumbersome to produce. It takes a lot of effort and time to produce a good, for example, um, learning video or explainer video. Yeah. Um, but there are also other types of videos which are kind of, I don't know, more, you know, um, created in a more fast, a more fast way. And um, that are kind of um, less effort. Um, then we have difficulties in engaging students because we don't see them usually. Um, we see them every now and then um, in Zoom, but also we don't see them in Zoom. Um, so I don't see, for example, your faces. I can just guess how you feel about what we're doing here. You know? um, <laughs> I don't see if you're bored, for example. There is also a large variety of tools um, and you're not aware of them. So this is like a typical problem. And um, there are like so many tools and tools with uh, tools like also platforms with so many functions out there. So how to make use of them, which is the right use in the learning scenario. So we will have a closer look today on that. Um, not sure we had that student, student engagement is this year. Um, school, uh, school children who no longer know how to read and understand a long text because um, it is um, um, short texts and videos are kind of the thing to go online, right? Um, the shorter, the better. So I see the worries here. Um, and yeah, I think this is something that we have to tackle um, in school um, that, <clears throat> text comprehension also for longer texts. But we, uh, I mean, in basic education, we can also already be happy that um, short texts can be understand, understood, right? So um, yeah, but I see the struggle here. Yeah. Um, then we have um, engaging. It requires agency and involvement from the participants. Absolutely right. Because you have more autonomy online often, 
very often. I mean, the st students are not used to that, some students. So I'm working with adult students a lot, um, and they sometimes even refuse it. Yeah. So you have to, you know, let them know what the learning design is about. So they could, you know, get the right kind of feeling of what it is and that it's different from what they are traditionally know from teaching and learning, for example. Yeah. Um, Challenges and possibilities of multilingual content. I truly believe that. Yeah, I also agree that there is a lot of um, there are chances here, mm, um, especially because it's so multimodal and you can use so many um, media types. And there is this chance of asynchronicity um, to include many languages, but also in a synchronous way, of course. Vital tools of managing a remote crowd. So course management is a, is, is it can be easy online. Yeah. Um, a great, great opportunity to avoid unnecessary travel and to open up learning possibilities. Absolutely right. This also has something to do with time management. Um, you can save a lot of time because you don't have to travel somewhere. And we save, um, um, uh, we have a better carbon footprint, of course, too. Um, if we don't have to fly in for project meetings or whatever, or um, drive somewhere one hour to get to a workshop or a seminar. So thank you for all your inputs. What is e-learning? So what is the definition of e-learning? It's basically all forms of learning that are making use of digital media. Um, this includes presenting and distributing learning resources, as well as communication between learners and or teachers. And especially the second point, sometimes you don't think about that when you think about e-learning. When you think about e-learning, you think about some online resources. But e-learning is much more than just an online resource. It, it is a whole um, learning design. It should be a whole learning design. I mean, very often we are, for example, creating online open educational resources, but it makes sense to think about how could they be in integrated into a learning design. And we will have a closer look at that too. So how are learning people, uh, how are people learning nowadays? Hmm. Um, well, I don't know um, how many of you already had a look on what is going on on TikTok um, and what your experiences were. So if you had some experiences, just type it in in the chat. Um, I would be interesting, interested to hear what you think about. No, I, I'm just saying I see no here in the chat. <laughs> and I, mean, I, I totally understand, you know, that you don't take a look at it because it can be pretty overwhelming at the start. And also it takes so much time until the algorithm is really good. Um, so you get a lot of trash when you're first on it. Yeah. Um, but if you have, if got, if you got your algorithm, you know, um, figured out, um, <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> um, you might also find that there is some educational content on TikTok. <laughs> I mean, it might not be the content in your algorithm, so you might have to, you have to rethink um, on what videos you watch and share and like, because this is there to de determining your algorithm, basically. Um, but um, it is possible to get learning content on TikTok. Yeah, it's true. Um, and if you check the hashtag, hashtag Edo TikTok, um, you will find some content. Yeah, I know about educational contents on Instagram more. Yes, on Instagram, there is a lot of content, but I assure you, there are so many, there's so much language content on TikTok. It's crazy because it's just a video-based platform. You see the mimic, you see the, 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 the body language, as well as um, the, the, you, you're also hearing the voice. How can you find anything there is the question by using hashtags. Use the hashtags or use terms that you like to know, like language learning, for example. Yeah, just type in language learning in this um, um, search window, kind of, um, on TikTok, and then it will show you all kind of content um, for language learning. And there is a lot and a lot of fun language learning content, by the way. Um, how can you validate this kind of learning? This is true for all kinds of learning, learning resources that are shared online. Everybody can share, everybody can create. So 
um, is this learning content really good? Because back in the times, um, there was um, a few kind of expert people who were allowed to work on school books, for example, and they issued the school books. And this is the quality kind of sign um, when, for example, the government in Austria said these and that school books are allowed for our schools and they are quality approved and it's, you know, everything is fine with them. Um, nowadays, <clears throat> there is content everywhere and it could be also content that is just incorrect and this is a threat of course yeah um so the point is that the, the role of the teacher is changing now from the person who is just you know um, doing or um, i don't know arranging what is in a school book because in some cases teaching is like that you know they just take the school book and they put it there for the students and here is the exercises yeah um nowadays learning resources are scattered all over the um world wide web and you have to choose a high quality learning resource that you approve as a professional in teaching in a certain field but this of course is a whole new skill set than it was before yeah it can be interesting even though not always completely satisf satisfying or reliable is um uh, roberta is writing that in the chat it's a problem when they try to over simplificate um yeah um if students are online they have a hard time understanding what are reliable resources or not so this is something like also competence that we have to build in students yeah um but when it comes to your teaching scenario or learning scenario that you want to create, you are the curator basically of the content and choosing the high quality content. And you, usually you should know, you know, if somebody on TikTok is saying something, for example, TikTok it could, could also be Instagram, yeah? if, it, if, it's, if it's right or not. This is like an example from Instagram. Um, this is um, the, um, it's called Kurzgesagt. This is the handle for the account. And um, Kurzgesagt is also called like in a nutshell in, in English. And um, they have a lot of explainer videos. So they are the experts in explainer videos. So if you want to know what a good explainer video in education is, you have a look at that. Yeah, This is just chef's kiss, really good. Yeah, and also very fun and entertaining. Um, so um, this is something I can recommend. And it's on Instagram. Uh, yeah. So it's also now possible on Instagram to share vid videos. You know, this was not you know so common like a few years ago. Because we're turning more and more to this kind of thing of sharing short, short very short videos. <clears throat> so what are actually now the top tools for e-learning? I think I missed something. Ah, oh, sorry. This is what I, you know, missed now. Good old Moodle. Um, top one learning management system in Europe. I think we all, at some point, have worked with it. If somebody is there who hasn't worked with it, please write it in the chat. <laughs> um, but I believe most of us um, probably have worked with it as a student or a teacher. Um, there are many advantages of Moodle, as it is open source, for example, and we have technicians who can do great things in Moodle, um, but there are also a few disadvantages um, that you might have experienced. <laughs> um, I will later on um, show a few examples of Moodle's co Moodle courses that I did in the past. Um, so maybe there is some interesting, I don't know, inspiration in it um, for your um, course as well. Um, yeah, so now we are at the right slide. I don't have a lot of experience with Moodle. We work with, uh, ah, yeah, Blackboard. Mm -hmm. um, what is BBB? Could you, you know, um, um, write the whole name, not just the abbreviation? Um, but I guess, ah, big blue button, of course. Thank you. Um, by the way, big blue button can also be um, um, included in Moodle, so you might also know it from Moodle. Um, <clears throat> but Blackboard has a pretty similar kind of logic like Moodle has. And we'll have a closer look at what learning management systems really are later on in the 
in a few slides later. So what are the top the learning tools at the moment? Um, yeah, but, but before I'm sharing that, <laughs> I have again an activity for you. Um, and again, I want to know where did you learn lately online? It could be, you know, all kinds of learning. It doesn't have to be in a course. So which kind of tools and platforms did you use? And you thought, ah, I learned something now. Yeah, it could be also a very small chunk. It doesn't have to be like a very big thing. Yeah. So um, you could also, of course, um, um, add tools that you use for teaching, not only for learning. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> we again, I uh, thank you, David, for sharing the link. We again um, uh, have a look at the uh, Jamboard. And you see here over there, um, we have um, the slides, right? And um, yeah, you already found that it's in the second slide. Here, here we are. Thank you um, for your inputs. Um, you can add, you know, um, you can keep adding um, the tools that you've been using. Um, I have a few questions. Um, so if you don't mind, I just have like short questions um, because some of you might don't might not know all of the tools and I also don't know all of the tools. So, um, but before asking, I just, you know, try to, you know, already cluster a bit like on the right side, we have all the learning management course management and learning management systems, yeah. Um, here are um, kind of digital boards, because, but actually a notebook, I believe, is a bit something different. We might have to class it somewhere else. Here we have like engaging tools like Mentimeter, learning apps, Kahoot, and quizzes. Here we have um, the um, um, a web conference, conferencing tools. And here we have resources like platforms where you can find resources. Yeah. Um, and here we have um, collaborative documents and Google Drive to share um, documents. Um, <clears throat> then I've started here. I, mean, I didn't know if here it was meant LinkedIn as a course provider or LinkedIn because you read something what somebody else posted. So could this person clarify which function of LinkedIn was meant here? Course provider. Thank you. Then I would move it over there, right? To the other course management systems because it is also a course provider, but it could also be used um, as a social network. So here we have Stack Overflow, which is basically like a social network for programmers. Uh, please correct me, this person who put it there, if you know, if you think this is not a correct description of it. Yeah, um, like a, a social network for programmers to solve programming issues. Oh, thank you. Um, so this is a social network to learn. Um, then we have a data carpentry. What's that? <laughs> so maybe you can put it just in the chat or you could open your microphone. Also would like to know what Hugging Face Hub is. Ah, trainers community. So also, um, it's also like a social network thing. Ah, who provide, uh, uh, the Hugging Face Club is, providing open educational resources? Or was it the data carpentry thing? The carpentry. Ah, thank it's you, okay. thank you, thank you. Okay, so then we put it maybe over there. Um, so I'm still waiting for the um, Hugging Face. On Hugging Face, you can find research data sets. Ah, okay, uh, I'm okay. I'm not sure, yeah, of course, and you can- I would, I would put it to the resources maybe. But if you find it's more accurate somewhere else, please just let me know. Um, I forgot what it, what again was whereby. Was it like a, a meeting platform, wasn't it? Like a web conferencing platform? Yes, it's pretty much like Google Meet. Ah, okay, okay, okay. I remember correctly. Then I put it all down there. We have Jupyter Notebooks. This looks like an, a note kind of uh, where you can take notes or something like that. Is it? Is this correct? It's more it's more in the context of programming. Ah, okay, okay. Um, so what do you learn there? Uh, you can actually uh, provide courses where uh, people can edit ah. the code and okay. you can explain the code uh, and uh, you can test different pieces of code there. 
So, in so it's programming a course language platform is, for programming, right? Yes, it's it's ah. for teaching and learning programming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. So I add it to the course management um, 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 course and um, learning management systems. So then we have Duolingo, which is basically like an app. I would say it's more like on the engaging Kahoot and and so on quiz thing here, but specific for language learning. Um, Data Camp looks uh, sounds also like something like um, providing information rather. Yeah, a course provider is yeah. commercial maybe. Ah, ah, okay, it's a course provider. Then we have it here again. Okay, so I think um, we did a pretty good job in um, having an overview of what you already did. So now let's check out what the top tools are because there is um, a study each year, maybe you already know it, um, about what people think the most popular tools are. Not actually what people think, but what the po most popular tools actually are. So. Um, <clears throat> and ah, but first <laughs> I have a different slide. Sorry about that. Um, it's getting exciting, right? What are the top tools? When is she finally spilling the tea? Um, so when we have a look at learning management systems, um, it is actually this whole eco ecosphere of of learning and managing learning around um, the complete package, basically. So you have the administration, like user management, course management, management of qualifications, evaluation. So this is usually what we have, what you all listed on the right side of our um, Jamboard, um, all these course providers. Yeah? Um, and they offer usually a learning environment with courses where, they can, where students can communicate, um, where there are tools to learn, uh, but where students also can do some kind of individual individualizations like modularization or um, other individual aspects of learning. And there is usually an authoring part too. Um, so where you um, decide on the interface design, the learning content, the assignments, the formative feedback and summative assessment. And some of the tools are rather on the authoring side. Some of the tools covering learning environment and authoring and learning management systems usually have it all. Yeah, just to have, you know, a brief understanding of, you know, how to um, categorize these tools. And now here we are, the top 200 learning tools. Um, Jane Hart at the Center for Learning and Performing Technologies. She identifies um, which digital tools are most popular each year. So this is the list for 2020, uh, 2022. And um, last year we had um, 1,000, or she had 1,700. 788 votes from all over the world, usually edu educational sector companies and NGOs. And interesting is um, <clears throat> that um, last year um, she had 500 votes less than usually. Um, so she thinks that it has to do that people are somehow, I don't know, um, yeah, they have enough of e-learning probably um, after you know, everything that happened during lockdown. Um, also, um, uh, uh, most e-learning tools and media weren't always used in the right way during lockdown because it just was emergency remote teaching, right? So there are some effects um, um, also on people who wanted to participate probably in this survey. So number one, YouTube. Number two, PowerPoint. That's interesting, right? <laughs> um, but I believe um, also interesting is that Word, um, Microsoft Word, um, is a, a cl um, climbed a few steps here. Um, I think this is because the collaborative aspect of um, Word and PowerPoint, which share in combination with SharePoint and Teams, makes it more attractive. Um, because in, I, I am following this kind of um, survey, or I have been following this survey for 10 years or so, and um, Word sign significantly and also Power PowerPoint lost some um, um, <clears throat> points here. And now they're doing better. Then we have Google Search as an important uh, learning tool. Microsoft Teams, of course, especially in the corporate world. Um, but also um, in higher education, more and more higher education institutions use Microsoft Teams. 
Zoom. But interestingly, some people who did the survey said, oh, they didn't mention Zoom anymore in this survey because it's so natural to them to use Zoom that it's like a standard, basically. Um, so um, also there is Google Docs and Drives, and you also men mentioned Google Docs and Google Drive. Um, LinkedIn is also on a solid seven here, seventh place. Um, especially, I think they can keep their place there because they're a strong provider for courses, but also they gained a lot of users after what happened to Twitter. So for all, for everybody who followed it, um, Elon Musk took over t Twitter <laughs> and um, now, especially in the science and education world, a lot of people moved away from Twitter. On a, you, and most of them, or many of them, moved to a social network called Mastodon, which is open source. But I'm not sure how, I don't know, how well Mastodon really works. So in case you're a Mastodon user and you have a good experience on that, just let me know in the chat. Um, I My experience on it is that, I don't know, it's not as lively as the conversation was on Twitter before. But many professionals um, are also, oh, more active now on LinkedIn, and I myself, I'm also more active now on LinkedIn. Then um, place nine here is Canva. This is actually the tool where I'm presenting from here, my slides. And um, place 10 is Wikipedia. And um, so these are just the top 10 tools. I would really recommend, ah, I, I have a, um, um, here um, <clears throat> in the chat a comment. I have tested Mastodon a bit, and it looks like some people moved there for good. Some still remain on Twitter. Yeah, I also have the impression that many moved there for good. So a lot of Twitter accounts are now dead. Yeah. Um, so if you want to, to see the full list, just check out toptoolsforlearning.com. And then you have a, a, a list like for 100, uh, 20, 200 tools, yes. Um, and what's interesting, um, it, in, in, the, in 2022, um, it was the first year where TikTok made it into the top learning tools. I think it's uh, on place, I don't know, 89 or something like that. So still quite far away from like mainstream and, you know, covering all um, kind of age levels in society, but it is there and a gaining importance. Um, <clears throat> so there are, many, there are many phases of e-learning actually. So what really e-learning is, I have the impression um, it always depends on um, who I'm talking to. If I'm talking to somebody working in corporate world, they believe e-learning has something to do mostly with micro learning and with um, some kind of um, um, content that is written one time and then you use it all over again, not tutored. Um, but there is um, there are so many you know ways and variants of e-learning. Um, it could be individual, like highly individual and tailored, but it could be also for the masses, like in a massive open online course, where there could be tutoring, but also there could not be tutoring because how do you tutor these kind of masses? Um, but you can moderate probably discussions. It could be informal learning, but it also could be formal learning combined with micro credentials, for example. It can be for fun, it could be entertainment. Um, this is basically the approach on TikTok, for example, mostly, and also Instagram. But it could be used for qualification too. Um, it can be learner centered in the sense of it is very much about what the learners um, want to achieve and solve. For example, Stack Overflow is very user-centered in a way. It is about their challenges that they want to overcome. And they ask the community for advice. <clears throat> and, but they're also input-oriented, rather input-oriented kind of um, e-learning variants where you rather find resources. Yeah? Also important, and um, necessary, um, but we have to think about at which point do we want to use this kind of inputs. And of course, there is this um, possibility that it's created by teachers and user-generated content created by learners. And um, the thing is, um, 
as I already mentioned, there is some kind of social transformation going on in education and in general, like who are the creators, who are um, those who are generating content. And we are moving from a consumption society where there is a teacher and um, this teaching to students, teaching, uh, teaching students, um, to the communicative or information society um, where the teacher is the facilitator um, of facilitating the communication among students and helping them, you know, to understand topics or get a mental um, model of topics. Um, and now we're moving towards the creative society where teachers are generators and generating ideas with students in a project together. Um, so this is a very different approach from the teacher approach. Um, and um, also it means we need different kind of activities for that. Um, and the teachers need different kind of a different skill set. Uh, so what ah, I think that input oriented can be also seen as learner centered in a way because learners can choose the learning materials on um, um, which one fits best to their needs. And yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. If the, the materials are open there to use, they can tailor and actually develop if they are fit for it, their own learning pathway. Um, that's absolutely right. So. Um, Typical delivery modes. Um, so what are the e-learning classics out there? We have digitally supported face-to-face -face learning. So basically on campus, but we use digital tools um, like, I don't know, PowerPoint or whatever, um, or maybe also an engaging tool like Mentimeter. We have blended learning where we have just some part of face-to-face -face somewhere. So it could be a course with a workload of 25 or maybe 50 um, hours. Um, and there is like eight hours in the middle, for example, face-to-face um, -face session in um, on campus. Yeah. Um, and the, um, <clears throat> but I think you are aware with this. You are aware um, of these terms, and you have worked with these terms before. But I think it, it can be. It makes sense to um, to just have it. You know, to see it again as an overview. And there is only uh, fully online courses where there is no face-to-face -face session, session at all. And it's usually synchronous and asynchronous communication. Um, in, um, and um, it is also usually tutored, but doesn't have to be tutored, like a MOOC, you know, it, a MOOC with, I don't know, like 500 people isn't tutored usually. And the thing is, this is getting more and more blended. So especially if you're creating um, learning resources, um, these can be used in all of these settings, basically. Yeah? So, um, so I'm asking myself, or I am actually um, trying to um, find the um, kind of um, evaluation um, um, kind of a concept, how to understand um, where to put educational resources in a learning setting and to find out what is the right design for all of these learning settings. What is the um, common denominator? And I will suggest something to you later on. So what is actually better, online or face-to-face? -face? And studies say that um, digital supporting learning scenarios attain the same good or bad results as traditional face-to-face -face learning and learning scenarios. Uh, so um, it is, Basically, it can have the same results. Hmm. Um, so what does the success of a, a digital supported learning scenario, scenario actually depend on? And this is the quality of the learning design, basically. Um, also, it is connected in to how well this learning scenario is, is addressing a certain educational problem. And if you manage to do that, it is um, likely that um, your learning design will be successful in the implementation. And usually there were some e e general aspects of learning, but I just, you know, put them here because you're anyway in the teaching um, kind of um, area. <clears throat> um, so, and your teachers and lecturers, so I just keep it short here. Fast feedback, problem-based learning, self-efficiency, active learning, interaction with peers are kind of standard aspects in learning designs that are positively influencing the success of learning and the learning outcomes. Um, so what do we need now to, what, what do we need to do for um, <clears throat> a good online learning design? Um, so you need actually a detailed plan, plan. So the learning design is the plan, 
physically. Yeah? Um, and the problem is in the world of online learning, it's just not enough to have a gut feeling. Um, so um, a gut feeling on what is good to do at the moment, because you cannot react the same way you, as you do in face-to-face -face lecturers. You don't see the people, you don't see how they react. And usually um, when you're a very experienced teacher, you don't think about it, you just do it. Yeah, but this is not enough for the online world because you have to know, as you already mentioned in the first um, brainstorming session with what we associate with e-learning, um, that you don't know the tools, you don't know the functions sometimes and how to use them in a, a fit for the purpose. Um, so it is really difficult to, you know, just teach based on gut feeling. You need to be very explicit on what to, on what you want to achieve and how you achieve this. And this is what we try to um, have a closer look on today. Uh, but um, <clears throat> yeah, just before we get into the break, um, like a quick five minute break, I would suggest, this is just a summary on the success factors of e-learning. So first, we need an educational program ad addressed properly. What it is, we will talk about it a bit later on. We need the learning design aligned. This means activities, uh, outcomes, and assessment. Um, also, we need to know about the specifics of digital media. So this is what we want to have a closer look on today. So these are the basic success factors of e-learning that we need to consider. And we are now um, going into details with them. Um, <clears throat> first, we want to ask ourselves, how do we plan actually for e-learning? So what is the right way to deal with planning e-learning um, scenarios? And um, <clears throat> the, first, the first things that we can ask ourselves is, um, where do we want to, um, on which level, educational level, do we actually um, work with our learning scenario or with our program? So what, it, what is it actually? Is it um, a learning or teaching scenario? Um, meaning um, the learning time is minutes to hours. Um, is it a course, for example, with four ECTS points or, I don't know, a higher workload, like, I don't know, a workload of 100 working hours, for example. Um, or is it a whole curriculum um, where you would, you know, um, do you, a curriculum or a program where you're involved for a half a year, a year or several years? Um, and um, and the top layer here is the institutional organization, and there would be another top layer actually, um, for example, educational standards. And um, the thing is, when we are designing um, teaching and learning scenarios, we it, it makes sense to think about the top layers and how um, our learning outcomes are aligned with the learning outcomes in top layers too. So this would help us to support, for example, um, any kind of formalization of your learning scenario um, in case you want to uh, provide um, the possibility to earn micro-credentials. Um, so if you make it transparent what the learning outcomes are and on which educational level they are, and what uh, and also, for example, what level on the international qualification framework it is addressing or the European, European qualification framework, um, it um, is easier in supporting um, mobility among universities. <clears throat> um, so this is the first question you ask yourself um, now, <laughs> if you want to create um, um, an online learning kind of scenario or program, what is it, you know, which level is it, you know? Um, is it involved in this kind of um, logic? Because it could be, for example, in the corporate world that there is, for example, no like real curriculum, um, but there is like institutional context that needs to be considered. So these are some contextual aspects. Um, but what is actually the, the educational problem that we should address so the learning design is really effective? Um, so what do, by we, what do we mean by problem? And the thing is, um, this is all actually about understanding the target group. Um, so what are their digital competences? What are their expectations? And what are the experience that they already have? You know, are they used to traditional, to traditional teaching where the teacher is in front and knows the truth? 
or are they used to different kind of teaching styles where teachers are more like coaches and they're in more, you know, um, um, unsecure and unsure kind of situations where they solve a problem together. So this is a huge difference on how you perceive also teachers. What is the living and working context? What are the, what are the needs? Do they need flexibility? Yeah. Do they need um, <clears throat> um, kind of individual individualization? Um, what are their media preferences and or per professional or personal goals? And also, what are their pain points? So, what are no goals that they wouldn't, you know, um, or that they refuse in learning scenarios? And um, a good way to deal with that and to understand um, the target group is the persona approach and also to use empathy mapping. So the persona approach is basically drawing up a, um, um, a fictional character um, based on um, the a group of learners that you have typically. And, um, and empathy mapping is more in the direction of how do the users feel. Um, how would you define the needs and the learning styles of the, uni of the university students? Would you send out a survey before the start of the academic year? Um, yes, a, a survey makes sense um, to understand what they um, expect, what they already know, and sharing this with the lecturers. This makes sense. Yeah. Also, what um, we did in the past is um, having this Padlet, like I shared with you, um, have students fill it out with questions um, before the semester starts and sharing this Padlet to all of the lecturers that they will have. And I think, and this is something that really is super easy and was very useful for the lecturers. So they can get a feeling of um, who the real students are they that they have to deal with. Because of course, if we use persona, the persona approach, um, this is very general, right? In the end, you need to know the uh, the, the, the students that are in your class. Um, so um, usually, usually the persona approach is, in, is also in, interesting if you have like learning scenarios with a lot of students or participants, and then it really makes sense to have like a persona written up. So this is something we did for a project where we wanted to create like an open educational course as a learning resource. Um, <clears throat> And for that, and it's for, for entrepreneurs in Europe. So we had, in, you know, there's a big target group. So we had to, you know, categorize them and get a feeling of what they really need and want. Because if you don't address the needs, they, they, you won't, won't care about the course. You know, we are developing course materials for, um, and, and on the learning resources that nobody is interested in. You want to, you know, avoid this especially in your European projects. So this is why we used here the, the persona approach. And um, also this is like something, um, like a very, you know, um, fast way, a rapid prototyping way of personas. You could do data-driven personas, which is a lot of work, but you could also do, um, 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 write up um, like ad hoc personas, um, which you know are much more based on gut feeling. But of course, you also have here the struggle or the issue that you might um, have kind of um, stereotypes in these kinds of um, rapid prototyping um, personas. So do you need to keep this in mind. Um, <clears throat> so my question now for you is, what is actually the educational pro um, problem that you want to address in um, a course or a, um, a learning scenario or an open educational resource um, that you want to provide in the future or you have provided in the past? So what do students have out of it? Why are they interested in you know, spending the time with your educational program or your resource that you are creating. And um, so what do they have out of it? It has to be really, you know, you have to build a good case because people online, they don't want to spend their time on things they, you know, find boring, right? That they are not relevant to them. So how is your course relevant to your target group that you are addressing? Um, thank you for your inputs. You can keep just writing. 
Um, I noticed that um, for one, there is this mandatory thing that they just want to finish the course because they need the credits. This is one thing. Like also if it's about educational standards or professional standards where they just need to tick the box that they have that. Um, this is a very specific, let's say, context in which um, um, e-learning can occur. Um, then a lot of it is about a lot of your um, um, problems that you um, or goals that you described here um, are about skills and competences. So this is an important point to consider for the next steps. Um, also, you, you very many a few of you write awareness. So awareness could mean many things. Yeah. Um, Maybe it could mean that they remember to use, um, I don't know, certain methods, you know. So um, if you use awareness, it makes sense to clarify if it's just about understanding or remembering, or is it maybe already, you know, higher cognitive skills. Um, so, um, so I have the feeling it's more into the um, um, skills and competence um, area. Um, pointing towards that. <clears throat> we have a specific job um, requirements in job offers and I think this is very important because this is highly relevant for the target group. If it's somehow connected to employability, it usually is very important to the target group because we all need to work something and we want to develop ourselves and we want to you know, have jobs that are fitting to our personalities and skills. Um, so we try to find educational programs that you know, help us. Um, and there is a strong motivation then, yeah, because here, in fact, the problem is disinterest and disengagement with education um, is written here. And, um, <clears throat> and I think it really depends, you know, why your target group is disengaged and disinterested. So here, a closer target group analysis could help to really identify, you know, what would bring them into, lure them into that educational program. Um, encourage the integration of research infrastructures in the curriculum. So here, here we have um, integration. Integration of research infrastructure in the curriculum is something, you know, it's like a higher order thinking still, definitely. And um, this is also something that we want to think of in the next steps when um, designing um, the whole learning scenario, learning and teaching scenario. And um, so what is a good learning design? What do we have to do to, you know, choose tools wisely to have, you know, a learning design that is aligned and that is interesting and addressing the educational um, problems that you just have, you know, pointed out. First of all, instructional design, the goal of it is to improve learning and teaching through the use of media. And you might have noticed that I use learning design as well as instructional design, and I mean the same thing. Um, learning design is a more recent kind of term for instructional design, um, which has a more learner-centered focus. So, because instructional design, it focus, focus, focuses on the instruction, but not on learning as, a, you know, um, as the word itself, it's the wording itself. Um, so nowadays, we tend to use learning design instead of instructional design. But I keep using the term instructional design because this is something people know. This is a term that people know. Um, and um, so it makes it easier to talk about things. And that's why I'm using it. Um, <clears throat> the roadmap to success. First, we have this target group analysis we have talked about to understand the, the educational problem that is really relevant to the group, to the, to the, um, to the target group. Then we identify learning outcomes. I cannot go into details today with that, but it's really crucial to write transparent um, learning outcomes focusing on the learning activities. Um, because the learning outcomes, we want to align with the activities and the tools. So we're choosing the tools based on um, the learning outcomes. But it could be that, that you, you have a certain tool set you know, you have to work with and you cannot, you know, use a different tool because of data regulations or whatever. And in this case, you might have to adjust the learning outcomes 
if your activities and the tools that you, you know, are provided with, that they are not enough to reach the learning outcomes. So it could also be the other way around that you have to check, you know, what is available, you know. And of course, based on the learning activities and tools, you are also thinking and aligning the thinking about and aligning the assessment activities and the tools that you use for that. Um, this is um, 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 something that we have wrote um, or, or summarized as a graphic here, a, a learning process in the project ATS um, assessment for transversal skills 2020. Um, and um, this is a more learner-centered perspective of the whole instructional design process in the end. So we are starting with assessing their prior learning and prior knowledge that they have. They're setting goals. So you could also set learning outcomes together with the students. You can have, you can have some kind of minimal fixed set of learning outcomes that they have to attain because of credits and what else. But you could also, you know, um, settle and agree on additional learning outcomes that are relevant to the target group. So this is also a way how to make it more relevant and interesting to the target group if you write learning outcomes together. But of course, this de depends on the target group and what their skills on autonomous learning are. Yeah. Um, then you develop and think about learning strategies together with the students. So you are not alone as a teacher um, um, thinking alone about all the um, learning strategies. Usually you do it together or should do it with the students because in the end, they should be the lifelong learners. They should know in the future how to shape the learning pathway. And they can only do it when they're involved in basically the learning design approach. They should be learning designers for themselves in the future. Then you collect the evidence of learning, the feedback and so on, you have self-evaluation and then um, based on that you can have a new goal. And in the core of it we have the e-portfolio approach. Yeah? Um, so the teacher is coaching and is um, assessing and the students are here as um, active participants, they are actively shaping the learning pathway. Yeah? Um, so this is a very much the idea of um, the generator and the coach and working together um, also, when it comes to metacognitive aspects of learning, yeah. Um, so here, you not only, you know, um, um, support um, the development of, for example, disciplinary knowledge and skills and competences, but also metacognitive skills and competences, yeah? because this is the way and the design of the whole um, um, educational program and the steps we have within it. So um, many of you might know the taxonomy of cognitive processes. This is based on Bloom, but Anderson and Cradwell have evolved it. And um, <clears throat> we have, remember, understand, apply, analyze, evaluate, create. So this is the lowest and this is the highest cognitive process. And um, we try to move towards higher cognitive processes. But this doesn't mean that remember, understand are not important because first you have to understand th things and remember um, vo vocabulary, for example, before you can um, move to the higher cognitive um, processes. So let's have a look um, on how the teaching style changes when we're moving to higher cognitive processes. So we're moving from lecturer and teacher, remember, remember, understand, to facilitator and tutor at apply and analyze, to generator and coach, so generating new project ideas and so on together with students, and evaluate and create. Yeah. So here we see how we have to evolve also as teachers, having different roles when we want to attain learning outcomes that are on higher levels. So as if your educational problem that you have written is on a higher level, you might have to change your teaching style too and the resources that you provide and also of course the activities. Yeah? Um, so it, might, it, it won't be enough just to be in the lecturer teaching position. And um, this um, framework is also very useful to evaluate if, for example, a curriculum or a course design or even a whole um, um, competence framework um, is moving towards higher cognitive levels, which we want to support also in terms of 21st century skills and in um, <clears throat> future skills that we need. Um, so we, so this is very useful to evaluate. So you can evaluate the learning outcomes and, and you know, try to move it to the cognitive process that we have, that we have here. And this is what I did a few years ago, and I checked the digital competence framework. 
And it was really interesting to see that most of the learning outcomes were on apply and really, really not many, you see it here, uh, are on evaluate and create and analyze. So this is not, you know, good re evaluation result for a competence framework especially. It could be that your course is focusing rather on remember, understand, apply, or it could be that it rather focuses on analyze, evaluate, create, because it is a, um, a course that is later in the curriculum, or a course that is addressing students that already have a lot of prior knowledge in this topic. Yeah. Um, so um, if you have a course and learning outcomes and you understand that you know, you have learning outcomes at remember and understand and at create, and in between there is nothing, this is fishy. That's weird usually. And then you have, should have a closer look on the learning design because then is something is off here, yeah? So this is a pretty good tool to evaluate and to see um, how well designed um, um, a learning program is. And if we now think about learning and assessment activities based on the cognitive processes, remember and understand our, you know, the multiple choice is fine, is, is fine for that. You can um, learn and assess with multiple choice. But if you move to apply, analyze, evaluate, create, we are very much in the direction of written examination, oral examination. The project is covering is it all from apply to, or can it cover it all from apply to create? And the essay and oral defense you are in analyze and evaluate. So this is just an approximate kind of, um, <clears throat> approximate kind of, um, 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 indication of where it could be. Yeah. Um, Juliana is asking, do you have an example of a good learning design? And um, I think there are many examples of good learning designs. Um, I have a few examples from my students because I'm also teaching instructional design at university and I ask them to write down a learning design in full detail. So they have to really um, think about all the details. Um, they have to, you know, give reasons why they choose which activities and so on and so forth. So, um, but um, I think later on, I can show you some good learning designs. If you mean learning design as a plan, I have created together with colleagues, um, or together with the colleagues I have created, um, a template for learning designs. So what you need to consider when writing down your own learning design. So there are a few standard criteria which you need to write down when you plan your learning design. And this um, is some kind of basic standard kind of prerequisite that it could be a good learning design. So what I will do is I will send you after this workshop the resource um, to this template. And I'm seeing we only have 20 minutes left. So yeah, <laughs> I try to move on a bit. Yeah, I will share the template. It's an open education, as it's actually open education resource template. I, it's a creative, I licensed this, it under Creative Commons. So you can all use it, you are invited to use it. Um, and it is basically, this template is a reminder of what to think of when you're designing your course, because you have it in your gut feeling usually, what you do in your course, but this template asks you to rethink it. So we have here the e-portfolio, which is basically nothing else but some kind of digital um, folder where you save your evidence, learning evidence and artifacts. It could be a bit more elaborate, like in a personal diary, a learning diary where you comment it and so on. But in the end, it is some kind of folder or some kind of uh, area where you save all your artifacts. Um, and, it, and the e-portfolio approach can, you know, cover most of the cognitive processes. You can do so much with it, you know, it's a very flexible tool. Um, <clears throat> what need, we need to keep in mind it is that the students will learn what they think they will be assessed on and not what may be on the curriculum or even what, the, what has been covered in the lecture. So, in the end, I already said that, you know, in the last um, this um, brainstorming thing in the um, about the educational problems in the Jamboard, there was there were a few people saying they need they need this program for um, credits, you know, um, the students need it for credits. And especially then, if it is needed for credits or for qualification, um, it is important to know 
what the assessment will be because they want to have good grades. They want to show somebody, an employer or an, a university or whatever, that they are an expert in it, in this kind of field. And that's why they need good grades and they want to and for, they just want to get the credits maybe also. Yeah. And in this case, it's even more important that it is clear what the assessment is and that the assessment is truly um, assessing the learning outcomes that you promised at the start of the learning process. And this is tricky, trickier than you think, or that one might think. Um, and <clears throat> most effective is the instructional design in the end, if we align the teaching um, and the learning activities with the used um, technology. So based on technology, we can do things, can um, be active, as learners and as teachers. Um, and this is also, um, as I already mentioned, important in terms of learning outcomes, because you can only show a learning outcome if you have these respective activities in your course. If you don't have them, you cannot promise these learning outcomes that they will attain them in the end. And so we need tools that truly support the attainment of, learning out of the learning outcomes. Yeah? And now I have a bad press, a worst practice example for you. Yeah? I created a course um, a few years ago for our lectures at my university, and I created in a certain program, um, which was a course authoring program, and it can be embedded in Moodle. And now we have a new course management system, and we just test it now at the university. And um, what happens? Somebody in the learning department or um, learning innovation and digital technology department. We have a department like for support. It's a support department for the whole university. Um, they used my course and they wanted to implement it in the new um, learning management system. And it was awful because they not only wanted to use, you know, the content and, you know, show it on this new um, uh, or have this content in the, on the activities in the new learning management system, but also they wanted to have it as a showcase of what activities there are in this learning management, learning management system, system as a good practice example. But what turned out, it was the absolutely worst because they just wanted to, you know, put inside this course all of these different kind of activities that are available in this learning management system, like, for example, a crossword um, kind of riddle. I don't know if this is the right word in English for that, you know, but they're like weird activities and they just don't fit um, the learning outcomes or the content at all, like not at all. Um, <clears throat> was that due to the lack of inoperability of, between the yes and no? Um, the, the huge problem is if somebody is creating the content, whatever content it may be, in some kind of authoring tool, yeah, and somebody else is now saying, oh, I want to take this content and I put it into another um, kind of format. Yeah? This person not only has to know very well the functions in a new format, but they have to be experts in this field too, because you completely change um, the, the, you know, you know, setting a right activity with a given set of function is a really complex task. Yeah, and so this is a huge problem. So you always have to know um, the your content and your feel very field very well. And of course, as a lecturer, you know it. But you cannot just give your content or whatever you have in whatever form to a technician and say put it in a different form. It it won't work out most of the cases. Um, this will, this need means that we need to create learning activities in open standard formats. Um, uh -huh. Yes, for example, the course that I, I created is in an open format. It's called a SCORM format. It's like an old format, but it still works. Yeah, it's a format for e-learning. Um, but they just wanted to do it in a different way in this new learning platform without the SCORM. And it was awful, unfortunately. Um, so it is tricky, you know, you always have to know the functions and the topic very well. This is so true. Also, even if the platform is called the MOOC platform, this does not mean that all the courses completed there can be called MOOCs. Yeah. And I have to say, I don't know, to find a really good MOOC, 
uh, yeah. So if you have um, a good MOOC example, just write it in the chat. Yeah, that would be lovely, you know, to collect a few good MOOC examples that are engaging because MOOCs are tricky. Yeah, they have a high dropout rate usually, and I'm I'm also including myself here. Yeah, I also dropped out many MOOCs. I I feel like oh, this is an interesting MOOC, and I don't know, I just didn't do it right. Um, <clears throat> so um, time is running, and um. I am afraid um, I will now leave out this activity just you know, for the sake of um, the um, aspects, specifics on e-learning, okay? So I'm sorry about that. Um, but we have the slide and if you want, you can you know, um, um, fill it, this, this section out in the Jamboard and um, I can write a few, a, a, bit, a bit of feedback or a summary afterwards. Um, so what are the challenges of designing for online learning and suggestions how to tackle them? It's getting interesting here. First of all, media appropriation. So how are media appropriated for communication processes? Are the chosen media fit for the communication process? And so here I have, you know, made up a few kind of lines that people are thinking or uh, saying, you know, very popular is this web meeting should have been an email. Why is that? <laughs> um, and ah, thank you, by the way, for sharing in the comments, right? Um, so how can it be that there are web meetings that, that could have been emails? Um, why are we um, wasting our time? Um, so the problem is um, different communication um, processes need different kind of media. For example, if a group of people doesn't know anything about the topic and the idea to is of the web meeting to find a solution about everything but they don't know anything about the topic we will use the whole meeting just you know i don't know wandering around the problem but we, under, we, we understand we don't but that we don't understand each other and the topic so this is a waste of time it would, be, would have been better to first share information everybody is getting informed and then we're meeting for um you know a decision in the web meeting um, and this is you know the thing with the email you could have shared kind of this information before in the email and maybe you could even you know already um, understand that we can find a solution without meeting because it's easy for us so not always it's important or necessary to um, you know meet online so what can be done in an asynchronous way also, this is um, um, a thing, uh, there's a lot, you know, going on also with uh, preferences. So um, young people nowadays, well, young people nowadays sounds weird, right? But young people nowadays say, <laughs> I hate phone calls. If they get phone calls, they absolutely, this is the worst. They, want, they, want to be, they don't want to be called. You first have to write a text message before you can call them. Yeah. So this is just a preference, you know, you cannot just cold call them. Yeah. Um, also, for example, I prefer text messages over um, recorded audio messages because we have a function now on um, WhatsApp, for example, or also any other messengers um, where you can um, record audio message messages. And some people just hate it. They just they don't. They, 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 I think these kind of people also don't listen to podcasts, you know. So you have to know what kind of preferences are there um, among your um, talk, among the people in your target group, so you can provide the right materials or a variety of materials that they can choose from. I feel uncomfortable in net, social networks. This is something that I hear very often when I'm working with my stu students in um, instructional design because I try to, you know, promote social learning. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, uh, uh, social learning and um, they just don't want that. We are working. <laughs> we are working in something like Slack or MetaMost. MetaMost, MetaMost is an open version of Slack, which is basically a bit like Teams, where you can chat in channels. Yeah, and um, they don't. They don't like it. Yeah. So I have act. Yeah, I have to be a role model actively in kind of a developing a culture of online communication. And how I'm doing that, I'm sharing later on. Um, so. We have to have a closer look on are we using um, these tools um, 
the right way for our communication purpose because otherwise we'll be frustrated this um like this web meeting could have been an email thing yeah there is a lot of tacit knowledge of teachers and learning about and with assumptions about learning out there so for example um, traditional learning designs plus zoom doesn't mean that we have a learning success unfortunately um so there is this thing called zoom fatigue i hope you don't have it <laughs> at the moment mm. and if yes i'm sorry um, mm. <laughs> but this means like you're tired of learning you're just tired of learning and um eight hours of zooming as it was you know um as it happened during COVID, um where there was this emergent emergency remote teaching going on is just not the right thing for learning because as we said uh, as we heard earlier not every um media medium has the capacity and the possibility of providing um the communication in the right way and zoom is not there to sit there eight hours and um, staring into a screen. Um, <clears throat> and so for that, we need to analyze the syn synchronicity that we need in the communication activities that we have. And um, I just see a comment. I also need to note the teachers who communicate with their students via face yeah, Facebook groups. Yes, exactly. If they don't have some kind of university, um, um, based um, social network, they use, use existing networks. But of course, we have data issues here. So it can be only voluntarily. Um, so we have to ask ourselves, do we need a um, synchronous way of communication? Do we need an asynchronous way of communication? What is best for the learning process? And um, who i don't know if somebody is here who understands german but here is like a lecture on what you know the um, how we can analyze the synchronicity in detail um a huge problem is also, also that people feel disconnected so um is it possible at all to build relationships online so how is it possible and um as you say as i already mentioned you know you need a culture um of online communication and you sometimes you need to actively socialize students to get them into online um feedback and online interactions with each other and with the teacher uh, but without this interaction, we cannot um, get into the direction of higher cognitive um, thinking skills. Yeah, so that's the issue here. We really have to socialize them that we can promote um, um, higher order thinking skills in online learning environments. And, and a good way how to deal with that is that um, the, like online so so the socialization is the Chile Selman's five, five stages model, and. Um, <clears throat> And basically, you start with um, welcoming, encouraging, setting up the system. Then you get getting into social online socialization with familiar, familiarizing with the tools and building bridges between cultural, social, and learning environments. Sending and receiving messages. Just um, empower people, support people, just to interact with with each other um, and to get comfortable with this style of interaction. Because the internet, of course, and the social network is perceived as a virtual panopticum, meaning everybody can stare at you and see you, but you don't see that they see you, basically. Um, and you feel observed and judged, and this is uncomfortable. So this is something you have to deal with. Also, the fear of missing out when you are confronted with a lot of comments from students. It's highly frustrated for students, usually. So how, if, especially if they're not used to social networks, how do you re um, how do you deal with this information overload that is created only in one course group? You know, how can you filter for information? How you ca can you deal with the fact that you are not online online for two days, for example? Yeah. Um, so step by step, we are actually um, getting into knowledge creation and development. Yeah. Um, and higher order thinking skills. So we're starting, you know, small and um step by step we are achieving high order thinking skills but the first thing is online socialization and that you learn how to work and communicate with others in the online space 
I cannot emphasize even uh, more how important this is. Um, and now we have five, four minutes left. Um, and I'm sorry that um, we couldn't, you know, do all the activities that I suggested at the start. And um, I just wanted to know, maybe you could just write it in the chat if you have experienced something else or if you, you know, were familiar with a few challenges that I um, proposed or suggested here in this, um, um, in this um, workshop. And um, let's see some um, good practice examples. And good practice always um, is connected with um, how well it is integrate, integrated in the overall learning design and achieving certain learning goals. Yeah. Um, and one tool and one um, um, thing that what I wanted to show you is um, this tool called Learning Snacks. I don't know if somebody already knows about it. It's like a micro learning program um, that is um, in messenger style. So here is a learning snack that I did a few years ago. And you see um, there is automatic feedback and it's pretty, you know, fast. And oh yeah, okay, sorry, I didn't read it. So it took a bit longer. Um, and here I'm actually explaining, you know, how to, you know, create constructive alignment, basically also what we did today. And, um, Oh, yeah, here I didn't read again here. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. But this is like the idea of it, yeah. And usually ah, this is also what we did today a bit. Yeah. Um, so if you want to go through it also afterwards, this might be a good summary to recap, you know, how to choose digital tools. Um and yeah. Um so as you see, this is like a really like a micro learning thing, you know, maybe to remember. Um, what we did in the past, uh, like in this workshop, for example, yeah, if you want to check if the students or if the participants can remember. Yeah. So the learning outcome would be in the rem remember kind of, maybe apply yeah, kind of area of the cognitive processes. Then what we have here, ah, by the way, um, I talked about this project where I used the personas, you know, to analyze the target group, if you remember. And this is the result, actually. Sorry, I didn't get this last bit. Is there a learning snack for today's workshop? Ah, sorry. Yes, you're right. Of course. I'm <laughs> here's the link in the chat. Yeah. Oops. No? Ah. So this is the chat to the learning outcome. And you can try and see if with the workshop today you could um, get the right answers here. Um, um, and different example, um, you know, actually, uh, this European project where we, you know, had to um, create the personas to get an idea of the target group. Um, so we have here um, courses that we develop based on the target group's interests. And for example, we have here um, promoting digital transformation is one course. And if you open it, it's a completely, you don't have to register or anything. It's completely open um, because we didn't want to, you know, combine it with passwords or whatever, because people don't like to register somewhere. You know? <clears throat> and here you see that um, I've used some kind of interactive script, basically, or interactive booklet you know? um, where I could embed videos. Um, you could also, you know, have like a, a person talk with you, like a scenario, <coughs> a dialogue scenario. Um, and we have ch chapters and you also see, you know, how far you've come with this kind of progress um, um, circles here in the menu. And um, so this is something, you know, like an interactive script where you also could include multiple choice examples. Yeah. Uh, um, as, um, as examples, uh, tasks. Um, so you could also include automatic feedback here again. 
and there are various, or you could also embed a Padlet, for example. So this is something which is very open, but still um, engage, um, tries to engage people in uh, social learning processes, but without a lot of effort in tutoring. Because especially if you want to provide something for the masses, and this is something for the masses, yeah, but it's not really tutored. It, it, there's a bit moderation in the Padlets going on, but that's all, yeah. So this is a possibility how not only to provide, I don't know, content and maybe a few interactive um, tasks, but also um, a social kind of aspect. Yeah. Um, and again, you know, you could embed links. This is actually done. Sorry, I didn't mention it. I used articulate rice for this. And it is, you know, a very easy way how to create um, interactive booklets. And I usually use it um, for um, content creation and um, course authoring. I think it's a very easy to use tool. Um, what are the uh, sorry? It's a comment and um, what or a question in the, in the in the chat? What are the best tools to use to create this kind of interactive materials these days? So I think the best tool indeed is Articulate Rise. It's also I think in the top twenty of this top two hundred learning on um, learning tools list that I've introduced you in the start. Um, it is pretty expensive, but um, it is so easy to use, really. It has some flaws, no question, but it's still, I think, the best on the market to create easy and good looking courses, in my opinion. You can also create interactive booklets on Moodle or also in Canvas or also not Canva, Can Canvas or Blackboard probably, um, but, it is not the same. This has a very different look and feel. Yeah. And now I'll show you how I use it in, um, on, in Moodle. You can embed it in Moodle. You can embed it. This is like a WordPress website. You can embed it anywhere you want, basically. So here is like a typical course that I have for my um, lecturers at university. So I'm doing also continuing education programs for my lecturers. Um, and um, here you see, usually have an intro, intro video, um, and here I have um, little, you know, pictures indicating here is something to click on. You know, um, for example, when I click on here, automatically it opens. Um, this is how you embed it. This is how it looks like in Moodle, and you open this interactive booklet. And we have to wait a bit because it's loading and it's taking a bit of time in Moodle on the servers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and um, so it's starting here. You see it's also saved, you know, it's saved where I start, where I, um, um, my, my, my progress is, is saved in Moodle. If you are accessing it online um, on the website, it is not saved. It's just saved for this one session you're on. But if you are Moodle and you're embedded on Moodle, you, um, it is saved for the user where you stopped. So this is very practicable. Does this require a specific plugin for Moodle? I don't think so. Um, it's a SCORM package, really. And SCORM packages is the oldest format <laughs> there is in e-learning. I don't know, like at least 20 years old, this format, SCORM. Um, and Moodle has it. So you, you, you include this, so usually it has it, yeah? We have it. and. And, and they didn't know about RISE before. So they anyway had it because it's the most common format in e-learning SCORM. And you can upload it. Um, I can show you how it looks like and how I embedded it. Um, so this looks is pretty much the same like what you see. You can you have chat, checklists here, right? Um, and this is just like the introduction for the learning outcomes and yeah, <clears throat> and also introducing me and my colleagues and stuff like that. So that's that. So I show you now in the teacher perspective, if you're interested, how I embedded it. Yeah, um, uh, I just have to here change to uh, the, um, uh, my role. So, um, voila. If I click, ah, yeah, here you see the SCORM package basically. And um, I do nothing else but <clears throat> uploading here the SCORM package. I export the SCORM pa package in Articulate Rise and upload it here. And that's all basically. Yeah. And, um, and then I have a link, I have a link to this kind of task and to make it look a bit 
you know, prettier. Yeah, um, I, I, you know, insert this kind of picture and link it with the SCORM package. There is a bit, I mean, there are things with the SCORM package which, which you need to have to consider, like some kind of settings, you know, that it looks really good. For example, that it's on the full screen and stuff like that, but it's just settings, yeah. Um, so um, this is basically what I'm doing here, you know. I have always the scripts. I have some kind of sessions here. Uh, um, it was great that you could join Maria today. Thank you. Um, and and to have me actually bye bye thank you bye bye thank you um so i have here for example a brainstorming kind of activity i have a forum yeah so these are things that i usually provide nothing fancy you know um i'm just, just having this um interactive booklets um with um tasks um, and it's like the red thread. It's like a common kind of um, um, way to move through a course combined with interactive um, um, activities and also peer feedback activities and also Zoom meetings and so on. And they are all kind of um, integrated in this interactive booklet. I also dynamically add content to the booklets if I see that it is necessary and re-upload it. Besides, does anyone else hate the horizontal bars at Moodle <laughs> currently inserts between all items? Yeah, Moodle is Moodle. So this is, for example, a different kind of Moodle. Um, <clears throat> and um, I, think, I think I have to also change the role now. We'll switch role to, so you have you know, the, the, the student kind of approach here. Um, I have a um, comment here. Yes, I agree. I think embedding H5P in Moodle does not work so well. For example, there were some issues with navigation errors. <laughs> That's what I meant. Yeah. At the same time, I found it a very useful tool for creating inter interactive presentations. And yes, it needs time to learn all the content types offered by H5P. So, yeah, I think it's a good thing to have HF H5P, but there are also other tools. I mean, it's free. That's a good thing, right? Um, so here we have um, a different Moodle with a different Moodle template also. So it is a bit of a different look and feel. I don't know if you see a difference here, <laughs> um, yeah. but um, I think it looks a bit different at least. Um, and here um, we also use um, 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 reticulate rice, but we didn't use this at that time. We didn't use this picture thing and so on. So yeah, so you see, it's just the basic structure. And we always said, this was a, you know, the question always is how much time do you have for tutoring in a course? And how could you include social learning without this r huge amount of tutoring that you could have with, I don't know, 80 participants like it was in this course. Um, thank you, Valeria, for, for being here today and for your inputs too. Um, and um, so usually we just structured it always the same way, what to expect from, from unit three, learning chapter for unit three, discussion forum unit three. So it's always the, basically always the same structure so people know what they expect. And I think it's important to share at the start the learning outcomes and to really make learners understand why you are suggesting certain learning activities so this is a really huge point when supporting motivation right if you you know use some tools or also like activities or methods like group work or whatever just because you think it's fashionable or it's or everybody's doing it that's not a good idea um students at the start, they might, you know, be okay with it, uh, but if it is, you know, coming again and again, and it doesn't have, a, you know, a real purpose, it frustrates students so much, so I wouldn't do it. And of course, it's difficult to, to write a good learning outcome. Now, retrospectively, I might have also twitched a bit the learning outcomes for today, you know, like written it a bit in a different way. But this is a very normal thing. It, it, this is an intended learning outcome. But you as a teacher, you also adapt to the situation and then it might change a bit, you know. So I think we have to be, you know, we need good intentions <laughs> and then be open enough to change and to correct 
So this has also has something to do with mistake culture, kind of, you know, and this is a big, a big problem, you know, also in course designs. When students expect the that the first that the course design that they are getting has to be perfect because they're used that teachers are perfect and always know the truth and don't make mistakes. This is a bad, bad. This is a, it's really awful. You know, this is the worst thing for learning culture and also for the teachers who don't have you know the room to navigate actually. But these are like the, the big issues nowadays for me, actually, I mean, I can only talk for myself in, as I'm working in edu education, where there is still like a traditional idea of what the teacher is and is supposed to be. And if you're showing kind of weakness or a mistake, it can be that you're discarded or discredited, especially if you're sharing something that is uncomfortable for students. So you need to be aware of what kind of reactions you might, um, yeah, um, might um, create. Yeah, learning outcomes can vary also according to the students and to the context where teaching takes place. I think absolutely yes, they have to be adapted to the group of students. Like I already you know mentioned before that you create or write learning outcomes with the students. It would be the ideal thing, actually. Yeah. Um, and also to the context. If you only have a limited um, variety of tools available and media, you can only reach that much and not more. And then you have to adjust the learning outcomes. So in this learning design process, you have to adapt and adapt all over again. You won't have this first learning design or this first plan of your lesson or whatever plan, um, educational program you're planning, um, and, don't, and you don't change it afterwards. Um, you have to um, revise it all over again based on the feedback you get from the students. At the moment you're teaching and afterwards when you close the learning phase and you have it, I don't know, next year again. This is a very um, real problem locally that the teacher persona is expected to be always right. Yeah, it's a huge burden and we cannot get into higher order thinking skills if the teacher cannot make a mistake. Because the thing about the higher order thinking skills is that the problems that we are trying to solve in problem based or project based learning are problems that we don't, we, we cannot anticipate the solution. Also, as teachers, we can't do that. We have to work towards it together with students. And then we are at the same level. And this is a different way of working, basically. <clears throat> yeah, sensitivity is key. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's a social term. We are always talking about digital transformation of education and higher education and so on. But this is really about the social transformation in higher education. Yeah. And this is a change pro process and change processes are always difficult, you know, you can always do it only step by step and explain what you're doing and being transparent what you're doing. Um, but this is a lot of effort. It takes your time, especially if you're the first one to do it. And if you have to give reasons why you do things differently, you know, to students, to other lecturers, to yourself, basically. Yeah. So. I think we have to be also kind to ourselves because we're always trying our best as teachers. Um, but we also only have limited resources. And, you know, it's always a compromise in the end, isn't it? Um, but I think having a bit more awareness um, of what we are doing, especially in the online environment, really helps to improve the quality of what we're doing. Mm -hmm.